Hey there, everybody. Um, we're gonna wait for people to queue on in. Um, in the meantime, I wanna welcome our guests. I'm Barry Norman, and we have Mike Devlin from Stanford and Christina Lopez from Barnard. And once we've got, um, I see people queuing in, once we have a, everybody in or mostly everybody, and I'm gonna let them do a further introduction. But while we're waiting for that, if you, we welcome you to ask questions. We got hundreds of questions literally before the webinar and I did my best to kind of grab the topics and areas that people were asking about. You'll hear some of the questions that you've asked. Um, certainly you'll hear some that are recognizable. And if you have questions as we go, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section. We have a moderator who will be looking at those and we'll try to take them if we have time. But um, in the meantime, let's um, let's get started. And uh, if if each of you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background, and uh, we'll take it from there. Christina, if we could start with you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Lopez. I'm the Dean of Enrollment Management at Barnard College here in New York City. Uh, I have worked at Barnard for about eight years now, and this is going into my 15th year in college admissions, which is crazy. Um, I attended New York University as an undergrad. Um, I majored in theater at Tisch School of the Arts and then went on and got my master's there. Um, and I did admissions at NYU undergraduate admissions along with this lovely uh, person right here, Mike Devlin. Uh, and we've known each other for years and uh, really excited to, to be here with you and, and talk about the admissions process. Thank you, Christina. Oh, sure. Hi, yes, hi everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, my, you're name on. <laughs> my name is Mike Devlin. Uh, I'm the director of admission at Stanford University. And as Christina said, uh, a former cubicle name, uh, neighbor of hers at, at NYU. We both worked there in the admission office. I actually got my graduate degree uh, at NYU. While I was there, my last job at NYU, I was the inaugural director of admission for their campus in Shanghai, China. And then I moved to Stanford about five years ago uh, and assumed the role of director of admission in fall of 2017, which I've been doing for the last four years or so. Um, I'm originally from Boston. Uh, so if anyone is from the Boston area, that, that's my hometown. Although now that I am a five-year and strong Californian. I, I do not think I will be going back because uh, it's very nice out here, uh, but I'm really excited to be here uh, with Christina and Barry with you as well, and, and thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's get started with the questions. Um, I want to start with um, some questions around scores, since certainly from the student's perspective and maybe from your perspective as well, that was really the biggest change um, in terms of policy this year. And so could you share with us what was it like reading without scores? Um, obviously, this was something that was the right thing to do, but it was thrust upon uh, most colleges. And so you didn't have the time to really think through the way you normally would have having transitioned to a test optional policy. So share with us what that was like. I'll, I'll start with it at, at Barnard. Um, you know, it, it was interesting. I think there was a little bit of, obviously, as you said, like just trepidation going into this process of like, how do we take away a piece of the puzzle? Um, but for Barnard, we, people are usually surprised that we don't talk that much about test scores in our committee, but it's not something that um, makes or breaks a decision. And part of that is because like most schools, our students are pretty self-selecting. So, you know, you see our averages, you're applying based on that. And so for the most part, they're all within that, that range. And so it doesn't really become a part that you're talking about very much. So for those that didn't submit it, other pieces of the application emerge just as they would if there was testing. Um, you know, the, the biggest piece, obviously the transcript, um, your curriculum and your rigor, um, was very important, but also just your, the writing and the display of, of that intellectual curiosity and, and understanding of our institution that fit really rose as well. And so in, in, in a lot of ways, it really did speak to this holistic review as it's always been, that the loss of this piece didn't necessarily affect whether or not we could see the whole puzzle, um, whether it was there or not. Um, it was an extra piece that was there to evaluate or not. Um, but there, it just allowed all of these other pieces in the application to emerge higher. 
So I, I agree with everything Christina just said. Um, we talked about it conceptually in my office, like pieces of a pie. And so, because we, we've had optional pieces of our application for a while. So we have an optional interview with alums. Mm -hmm. We have optional arts portfolios. There's optional athletics reviews. There's lots of optional pieces. And the way we talked about it was, it's like a similar size pie, but it might be an eight piece pie or a six piece pie, but it's still a whole pie. So mm -hmm. each piece might be a little bigger, meaning they might have to represent a little more in the process because there's fewer things to consider, but you are still whole, whether you have eight pieces or, or six pieces. And that really reflected in the way we did review as well. So we had a large portion of students uh, apply without testing and we admitted a large portion of students without, without testing. Uh, and, and, and other than that, I would just say everything Christina said really holds true in terms of holistic for, for us as well. And as far as the numbers go, I don't know if you have them available, but um, percent of students who applied without scores, percentage admitted who were, uh, you know, uh, without scores, do you have any data to share on that? Um, for Barnard, it's about the same. It was um, half of our population applied without scores, and it was about half of them that were admitted without scores. So it very much correlated um, in the same way. Yeah, we haven't posted our numbers publicly yet. We post them in the fall uh, after everyone has kind of arrived on campus. Um, so I can't give exact numbers, but it's very similar to what Christina said. We had a large portion who apply test optional and we had a large portion who we admitted uh, who were test optional as well. Great. Um, and do you foresee, I know you've made announcements about the next, um, I believe for both of your institutions, two years, but um, what about beyond that? Is Do you have a sense of whether or not test optional will be here to stay for Barnard and Stanford? Um, you know, I know there's no official policy yet, but certainly younger students are asking about that and thinking about that. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I think the the adoption of this policy was meant to be temporary as, you know, a response to COVID, but as we are, you know, in this moment, we have decided to do a, an actual study on our testing policy. Um, do we really feel that the test is an actual indicator of first year success or not? Um, and conversely, with those without testing, do we feel that it was necessary or that it did make a difference in their success? So we'll be doing um, a, a study during these next three years. Uh, and then based upon that, that evidence, we'll, we'll make a decision moving forward. We're similar um, in that, again, we, we didn't plan on this, but we really see it as an opportunity to see to study how students who have been admitted without this specific characteristic perform once they get to Stanford. Is there any difference in their performance? We don't think there will be, to be honest. Uh, we think we've admitted just as strong as a class as we always have, uh, but we'll be interested to see how that kind of pans out when they get here. And then we can use that to inform our decisions. Of course, with us, and Christine, I'm sure this is the case with you too. You know, we have a faculty steering committee. They have a lot of opinions on the efficacy of using these exams as well. And we have to take that into consideration. So it will be a multi-year process for us to figure out you know, what the impact has been. Great. Um, and, you know, with the, with the, the elimination of the subject tests, and then there's test optional, of course, as much as students want the test to be gone, then they start grabbing onto others, like the APs, right? That's what's mm -hmm. left. Um, and so I have gotten questions and there were questions that came in about, you know, if there's just this renewed focus on them because other things have fallen away. Can you speak about how you use or don't use APs in your process? And also I have students sometimes, a lot of high schools are abandoning the AP program and don't have AP classes. And then students say, even though I didn't take the AP um, ex uh, class, should I take the AP exam to show something or demonstrate something? Can you speak to that as well? Yeah, I mean, within our process, um, you know, obviously the, the most rigorous courses you're taking are in your senior year, and we don't get those scores until after decisions have gone out, right? So you're looking at scores from junior year or previous. Um, you know, I, I have my, my personal opinions on APs. Um, I know that there are many schools that are dropping AP courses and changing their curriculums, and that is absolutely fine. Like, we do not have any preference towards AP or not AP. It's really up to each individual school how they feel they would want to, you know, distribute their courses, their own pedagogical, you know, I, you know, ideas, that's totally fine. Um, and in terms of whether or not they should take the exam, 
quite honestly, it's not necessarily a make or break thing in our process. Um, I think that it really does, it depends on each individual school, it depends on each individual class, it depends on each individual person, whether they want to take the exam, we don't require them to take the exam if they have taken an AP course. Um, so if they um, do take the exam, they can choose to submit the scores or not. We do take them for credit um, if they choose to take, submit them to a certain degree, but it's not necessarily something that I feel should change over. It's not, the nature of those exams doesn't necessarily replace what the, what SAT or ACT did. Um, and it, and quite honestly, it really depends because they're not all taking the same exams anyway, right? There's no standardization um, in terms of, of what people are taking. So um, it's not something, for, at least for, for Barnard, that we think will do it. So I would echo Christina's point of like, I'm, I'm going to talk about Stanford right now and not mm -hmm. because there's so many schools and I, I, I'm sure there are schools out there that if they're very serious about it and they do want to see maybe a certain amount right. of exams, I can't say. But uh, for Stanford specifically, for this past year and this year, because of COVID and the disruptions to the educational climate and how the tests were administered, just for the last year and this year, we've definitely had the opinion of, if you have a great AP score and you would like to send it to us, great. If you have a poor AP score, we're gonna chalk it up to the fact that the testing was kind of off this year and the educational system might not have been preparing you through no fault of your own. So I wanna put those kind of in a separate bubble. Um, but in general, I would say we view strong AP scores as a positive if you have them. But, but Barry, to your point, first of all, not everyone has APs. Internationally, very few students have access to APs. Um, IB is much more common outside of the United States. And so we're just, admission offices, especially at highly selective schools, are so accustomed to dealing with myriad uh, academic systems that AP is one of them. And so as a student from the US, you really don't need to feel like, especially if you're not in an AP curriculum, that you need to somehow seek them out uh, when you're applying to highly selective schools. Your system and excelling within the system that in which you, you know, exist is more important than seeking out some other kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talk about this a lot that, you know, you really, you, you can't be compared to kids at other schools. There's just different opportunities. So you Absolutely. have to focus on where you are and then say, you know, what's available to me? You know, how can I challenge myself and hopefully also do well? Um, and this also brings me to another question that I was actually going to ask later, but it kind of dovetails nicely here. And it was a question that came up from one of our attendees, which is, you know, it was basically about why does one school get a lot of admits and another school doesn't get a lot of admits. And I know that um, it's year to year, right? Some years certain, it, it just depends on which applicants come up, I, I think, right? Um, but could you speak a little bit more to why you can't compare what's happening at your school and another school and take that at one year or even a few years as sort of like you like a certain school better, you have a better relationship with a certain school. I, that's a big thing that people believe. And I think it would be helpful if you could speak to it. Yeah, I'll, I can jump in on that one first. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I truly, but so one of the things I look at is there's, there was more schools in the United States with valedictorians, for example, than we have spaces at Stanford. So it's, it's just, there are, there are too many great students at too many great schools that we could just take at least one from every school every year. It just doesn't work that way. I think furthermore, at least for us, and I'm sure this is the case at Barnard too, we aren't looking at schools with any kind of quota system um, or need to enroll a certain amount or to not enroll a certain amount at any school. And that manifests in sometimes in odd ways. So there are years where, there might be multiple years where we don't admit anyone from a school not because we don't like the school, not because there aren't fantastic young people at that school. Just when we looked at each student, our admit rates are so challenging, we just couldn't get there for each student individually. Then one year, we might admit five students from that school um, mm -hmm. because it just so happens, I think there's people who know this, who have um, students, sometimes there are strong years at high schools and there are strong cohorts. And it just so happens we might admit four kids from one high school in one year. And then we might not admit anyone the next year. And it, I it really need to be clear that it is not about the relationship we have with the counselor at that school uh, or some directive from our universities where we have to enroll a certain number from a certain school. It's for us at least looking at the individual strengths of each applicant and understanding that that might mean some years some schools have more students and some schools don't have any. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Um, I, I think that's a really key point in understanding, like, we don't admit schools, we admit students. And every year there could be different students on that roster. And some of them are gonna be great fit for our institution in that one particular year, and maybe in another year, not so much. Um, I think the other thing to think about is, you know, I think a lot of times students and, and families are thinking about their own little neck of the woods. And so it's, you know, comparing my school to this school down the street or the one around the corner. and that's because that's what's in your world. But in our world, when we're looking at applications, we are literally looking at the world. Um, so while your student um, and your school may be strong in this pond, now you're going into the ocean, right? Where there are many incredibly strong schools with many incredibly strong students all around the world. And our, we just don't have the space for all of the incredible students that are coming from all around the world who are gonna be great fits for our institution. So in, in thinking about that and understanding the, the broadness of the students who are applying to our institution, like I always say like, there, there are so many incredibly talented, strong students that are applying to our institutions that if you are not admitted, that's nothing personal against you. You know, it's, it's you're in the ocean. You know, it's understanding you're amongst some of the, the best of the best. Yeah, and also there's an element of, um, I think also students feel like I did everything right. You know, I had the grades, I had the scores, I did extracurricular activities, like what more could I do? But it's really about so much more than just the numbers. And that's one of the most encouraging things about the process, but could it, it could also be the most frustrating thing for students who are trying to feel like they have a better handle on it. Um, but to your point, you know, fit is so important. You know, Barnard isn't for everybody. That's a good thing. Stanford mm -hmm. isn't for everybody. That's a good mm -hmm. thing. And, um, you know, there are such tough decisions. And this also gets to a question that I was going to ask later, but I think makes sense to ask now, which is even as directors and deans, do you have you had, and I know the answer to this question, but have you had to make decisions that were hard for you? Like, were there kids that you didn't take that you really wanted to take, but just couldn't given the numbers? every single year, <laughs> every single year. Um, you know, I, I think all of us in, in admissions, but certainly I'll speak for myself, every year, there's that one kid that you just fall in love with. Maybe you met them on the road and you've had great conversations with them. And this is the one that you really want to advocate for in committee. And, you know, you advocate for everyone on your roster, you know, but this is the one that you're close to. And, you know, for whatever reason, the committee doesn't see what you see, <laughs> you know, and it's tough, um, especially when everybody else in the room is coming with their people that they, they love and they really want to see in the class too. And so every year there are students who are great fits. Um, who've done everything right, but you know they're they're just inched out because of this small amount of space that we have in the class. So yeah, that that is committee. We're all duking it out over those students. Completely agree. Um, we have so many fantastic young people that apply every year. Who uh, Barry, to your point, do everything right. There's nothing wrong. There's literally nothing wrong in the application, um, and we just we just don't have room. And, you know, it's our job too to be stewards for the entire university and to consider all the needs for the university. And so it's not just, it's not just holistic to you, it's contextual for you and the entire pool and yeah. what we're looking at and the university's needs at that time as well. And um, I know it's hard not to feel like it's personal, for example, if, if we're not able to admit you, but I can assure you, it, it, it truly, it truly isn't. That doesn't mean we don't care and we don't really get to know each person. But our decision-making process has to look at everything the university needs and everything we want to do when crafting a class. And sadly, that means we can't take anyone. Sometimes when students will email me after and say, you know, what what could I have done better? There is no answer. There's nothing they could have done better. And I often say to them, you know, our decision on your application isn't our reflection on our belief in you or our belief in your ability to do well at incredible colleges and universities. It's just a factor of here's the spaces we had and here were our priorities. And, and so those were the students we were able to enroll. Yeah, it's a pretty complex puzzle, you know, that um, that obviously 
we're not on this side privy to. Um, and even you guys don't have control over every single thing. Uh, you know, you both mentioned you're, you can't make every decision that you want to make. You know, everybody has right. somebody to answer to. Um, right. And it's just a part of the process. What about wait lists this year? Um, can you speak about wait list activity at, at each of your schools? Yeah, so we did a, a very small amount of, of wait list um, and we actually went pretty early on, um, which is always why I say to students, you know, like if you are put on a wait list and that school says, send in a letter of continued interest, don't wait. Don't <laughs> Because you don't know when they're going to go to wait lists. Because by May 1st, we were done. Um, and so you want to, to send it in as early as possible. Um, I think at this point, our, our class is, is full. Um, and so we may not have any more activity. But, you know, every year is different. Um, you know, there are years where we've taken, you know, 100 students off a wait list. And then the next year, we would take five. Um, it just really depends every year. We're very similar. Uh, we've gone twice but to very very small cohorts uh twice mm -hmm. in june we think we're done um although you know we're looking to enroll a certain number of students so if we have uh visa challenges with students outside the united states or we just don't have enough if we're under what we're looking for we might go again although it's likely that we're done and similar to christina this year is very unique because of stuff that's still going on with COVID. and last year was too but in general yeah we rarely go though it's usually a really small number and while we're talking about international students, can you talk a little bit about what that looked like on each, each of your campuses? Obviously, last year it was very tough for kids to get here, but maybe they enrolled uh, virtually and, and kind of what those numbers look like. And people certainly want to hear if and how it might impact um, this year's class. Mm. Yeah, so we had, I think in general, the, the last couple of years, we've nationally seen a, a decline of, of international student applications um, for a variety of different reasons, economical, political, et cetera. Um, and so I think, especially with COVID and restrictions, that definitely had an impact on last year and this year. Um, for, for those students who were admitted, at least when I'm speaking for Barnard, um, those who were admitted, we did have a very high yield. Um, and we are anticipating that they should be able to attend now that embassies are opening up a little bit more. That list is broadening of, of those um, that are, are going to be allowed visas to the United States. Um, we're still waiting on some other major um, countries, India specifically, given their, um, their outbreak with COVID. But um, hopefully, you know, our, our expectation is, is to get the students here. Um, unless there are, are, are other, you know, health restrictions, but. Yeah, so we, um, so last year, there's the international situation and there's the deferral situation and they're not, there's a bit of a Venn diagram overlap, but not completely. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we did have many international students decide to defer to take a gap year. But we also had a lot of domestic students decide to defer and take a mm -hmm. gap year. Mm -hmm. um, so our gap, our overall deferral gap year number was very high. Uh, so we've talked about this publicly now. So usually it's around 50. Uh, this past year it was like close to 400 uh, that took a gap year, which we allowed. We allowed them very late. If students didn't want to do it. For the students who did attend, even international, we were fully remote as a campus unless you had to be on for safety reasons or health reasons or educational access reasons. So most of our international students did a full freshman year, but did it remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how that impacted us this year, Stanford as a university decided that even though we had a, we have a very large cohort of students coming in off of a gap year, that we would still enroll the same number of new students that we always do. That sure, does mean- Mike was very happy with you. <laughs> yeah, that, that does mean that the usual class that enters Stanford is 1700. And this year the entering class will be close to 2100 uh, for one class only because we committed to both keeping the, the space we always had, but allowing all the other students to come back in. Um, so that's so that's where we are in terms of how we handled that. Um, and then in terms of international numbers in general, we were, we were way up um, in international interest this year. Um, but overall, their proportion in the class is about the same. It's a little higher, but about the same as what it usually is. 
Thank you. And uh, deferral, uh, I know we didn't talk about it necessarily for Barnard, but um, how did that, uh, did you have a similar uptick in deferrals? And also even for this year, was the class of 2021, have you seen uh, a higher rate of deferrals for them relative to a non-pandemic uh, adjacent year? And, uh, and, and at Barnard, did, uh, did the rate of deferrals impact the, the number of students that you admitted this year? Mm -hmm. Um, so for Barner, last year, we actually had fewer deferreds than we normally do. Typically, we have anywhere between 35 and 50 students defer on a regular year. Um, last year, it was closer to 25. Um, now, part of that was we were very hard on deadlines. Um, and so we did um, extend that deadline out. Um, but even for this year, where we have been very generous. The numbers are the same and still some hovering around like 2025 um, going to first. So that didn't really impact the size of the class. Um, although our incoming class this year is slightly larger than it was last year, um, but it, it wasn't um, because of we needed to reserve space for, for our deferred. So um, it's, it's about the same. We had a lot of students who asked about deferring um, but once we decided to go remote, they, they didn't necessarily feel that they needed to defer and they, and they continue to enroll. Great. Um, and what about any other trends in the applicant pool uh, for the class of 21 that just applied? Were there you know, anything you noticed this year compared to other years? Um, or was the makeup of the class any different than in prior years, if you could share a bit about that? Yeah, I would say the addition of test optional has been great in terms of just widening that pool, um, especially in terms of diversity. Um, we had a higher number of students of color apply with um, test optional. We have, um, which then correlated as well to seeing those numbers on, on the admits and enrolling. Um, we had many more uh, low-income students and, and first-gen students applying as well. Um, you know, and, and thinking about, like, you know, I, I had expected, um, you know, certain trends with the test optional, but quite honestly, it really ended up being pretty similar whether you went to an independent school or a public school and, and you know, all of that. So, um, but I, I do think that there is just kind of a, a widening a little bit of, of that pool um, and students who are were making that reach for us that may not have felt it would have been attainable um, if they if we have required testing. Yeah, agree. Um, we saw we have so in the fall, uh, but we saw in general similar increases in demographics that uh, Christina just mentioned, um, be it the number of students that we've admitted and thus were applying that were Pell eligible or mm -hmm. first generation, uh, students of color from various backgrounds. And then also for us, um, countries internationally for whom we hadn't seen applicants or we had seen fewer applicants mm -hmm. who, for whom maybe the SAT is not a cultural barrier. It's a little, literally mm -hmm. like a physical barrier. You can't get somewhere to take the exam. Uh, we just yeah. saw a large increase in those as well. And a follow-up question actually about international students. Um, I know that there's no one definition, but this is often a question about, you know, how students are read if they're either, if they're in school abroad versus where they have a passport or a citizenship. Can you just speak very briefly to that, just to clarify for folks out there? Well, this is a, another one where I would say it's going to depend on the university. Um, and so I'll do, I'll just talk about Stanford. So Stanford is, is actually need aware for non-US citizens. Uh, so what that means is if, if you're not a US citizen, when you apply, we ask us if you will require financial aid to attend. And then that will actually impact our decision-making process on your file uh, because the university has, the university is committed to meeting full demonstrated need for all the students that we admit. We graduate close to 90% of our students without any loan debt whatsoever. But there's also only so much money for students who aren't US citizens. And so to maintain our full need policy, we can only admit so many students who are not US citizens that have need. So what that means for us is um, the review process is the same. You get the same type of review. You go through committee the same. 
we're looking at you as a person in the context of your area, just like we would with anyone else. It's just for us at the end of the day, if you are a non-US citizen uh, who has need, um, there's just a smaller amount of spaces available for you. So that impacts it, uh, but that's how we look at it. So if you're a US citizen studying abroad or taking classes in a different country, you're considered a US citizen in our process. If you are a non-US citizen studying at a boarding school in the United States, we're still looking at you at the, in the context of that educational system, uh, but we would consider you a non-US citizen. Right, so they're being read within their high school group and then the issue of aid is separate. Is that right? Yes, yes, for Stanford, yeah. Yes, and that, that is exactly the same at Barnard. Yeah, I think, 100%. you know, in general, students are read with their high school, regardless of citizenship or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, any any of that. But when it comes to aid, then there are obviously some other things to take into consideration, given roles and resources. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, can rising seniors or even some younger kids expect to see uh, Stanford or Barnard admissions officers in real life on their um, high, in their high schools or at college fairs this fall? Can you give us an update on um, your travel plans um, and also, of course, on uh, just what campus visits might look like in the coming months? Yeah, it's still evolving, but I think uh, for this fall, we will probably still be doing virtual um, events and, and visits. Um, without really any any travel, perhaps maybe local, perhaps maybe having some alumni attend um, some fairs, you know, outside of the state. But for the most part, we will be virtual. Um, our hope is that we will be back on the road in the spring, um, and and being able to to greet rising juniors and and do programs again. But um, for the fall, we we will be here. Um, in terms of on-campus opportunities, um, we will be hosting uh, tours again, guided tours in the fall. Um, and right now we have self-guided tours so students can come on campus and walk around outside. We do actually have students on campus because we do have a summer semester. So there are people you can talk to. It's not a completely, uh, it's not a dead campus by any means. It is bustling. Um, and so that um, is, is exciting for students to be able to come in and feel the energy of, of Barnard during the summer. Um, and we should be back doing um, guided tours in the fall. Stanford is almost to an exact point, the exact same thing. So I have nothing else to add to, to we're doing the exact same plan at, at every one of those levels. Yes. And what about the virtual thing? I mean, one of the, I don't know if silver linings is the right word, but there's been some wonderful virtual programming where students have been able to connect with current students in a way that they never would have previously and even connect with admissions officers in a way that they couldn't. What are some of the virtual offerings that you've um, introduced in light of COVID that are that will be at least maybe here to stay, but at least here for, for next year? Yeah, the transition to, to virtual was, was really surprising. Thank God for Zoom. Um, we've all become very proficient in Zoom, uh, but it was it's great because we are small office. Um, there are literally 12 of us fully staffed, and due to COVID, we were not fully staffed, so there's even fewer of us. Um, and it's always been difficult to do travel and run an office at the same time. And so our time on the road was always limited. And so, you know, there's only so many students that we're actually going to be able to interact with on, in the fall. But because we were virtual, that opened up tremendously. Um, we're, we're meeting students at schools that we may never have visited, rural students, and going doing programs in, in other countries where we may not have visited. Um, and the way that we, while we didn't do any individual school visits virtually, we had our reps email all of the students in their area to come and do sessions with them. And, you know, that was great because then it, normally if you're doing a school visit, you're only interacting with the people at your school. But these visits, you got to interact with people across your whole state um, and, and meet people and hear their questions and, and of what they were asking. And it was that was a tremendous bonus for us. Um, it also really allowed us to think beyond space issues. You know, we are a small campus. And so when it comes to events, on campus, we only have a limited amount of students and families that we can host. But without that, for an open house, I have 800 people on a virtual open house versus maybe only 100 people on campus. And I can do it over five dates. 
versus just one day. Um, so the amount of freedom that we had in terms of size and scheduling and scope and reach um, was tremendous. And so, you know, as we kind of moved back into this re, you know, emergence of the world, <laughs> emergence back into the world, um, we're thinking about what does it look like to have you know, this hybrid model of recruitment, doing virtual as well as doing on campus. You know, the on campus will open up slowly as we get used to having our students on campus and things start to, restrictions roll back. But, um, you know, being able to reach more students um, in a virtual world has been a tremendous um, thing for us. Was that surprising to you? Like how many, how effective it actually was, or were you were you thinking it you was know, such a? I, it, was, it was surprising in that you know I think we were all feeling like people are going to be so burnt out from doing Zoom school that they're just not going to sit in front of a computer screen for another hour. Um, and so, with that in mind, we really tried to create programming that was intentional, that was engaging. Um, and that really relayed the information that was most salient to them so that we're not sitting here wasting your time um, to make it a really meaningful experience. And I think that was really reflected in a lot of the feedback that we got. Um, so, yeah. And Mike, what about you guys for the virtual programming? Yeah, it, it, it's funny. In terms of success, we just got this survey result back from students who did our alumni interviews. It's a little tangentially related, but I've been thinking about this because not only did we interview the most students we've ever interviewed and the highest proportion we've ever interviewed because mm -hmm. of we did it fully remote, we also got our highest kind of satisfaction rates, both from mm -hmm. the applicants and from the interviewers that we've ever had doing this. Mm -hmm. We've done this for over a dozen years now. Mm -hmm. um, and so just like all of our outreach, all of our uh, on-campus programming that we've tried to replicate, we're, we know we can't go back to just the way it was because the this new way has been so successful, not just in expanding the scope, which it absolutely has. We talk to students from communities inside the US and we talk to students from communities around the world that we just never had the chance to meet and interact with before. And I, I believe test optional was a large part of our expanded applicant numbers, but I think this type of access to us really helped as well. So we're gonna keep as much as we can, but look towards a hybrid model where we start Yes, offering programs on campus again, but you know we have a program, we, we would call it officer of the day, and you could just stop by on campus. And if you walked into our building at Montag Hall, there would always be an admission officer there able to meet with you, which was great if you could afford to fly to Palo Alto and come on to campus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we did is we just started doing virtual appointments, you know, 15, 20 minutes where you can meet one-on-one -on -one with an admission officer. They're always booked. Um, and these are kids who just never would have been able to make it to us that can now. So we can't lose those because they've just been so great in terms of access. So we're gonna look towards some kind of hybrid model. Um, thank you. And um, you know, there are a lot of students out there listening who are having difficulty paring down their lists or even creating it for that matter because as great as the virtual programs are, a lot of times when it comes down to really finalizing the list and you know you have your few that you really love but then you got to figure out well you know what, what kind of what priorities do I have and which one do I maybe I want to apply early to or whatever what advice do you have or what can you share about your campus culture to give students a better sense of whether or not Stanford or Barnard is for them and I'm intentionally setting aside uh, numbers and academics here because we know that you know there is a certain level of expectation but then most people who apply are going to hit that mark and so if you could speak a bit about the social culture on your campuses and the, the kinds of students who might actually really thrive there yeah um, you know I, I think for Barnard we are a, a kind of a unique experience you know and just all of the pieces that make up who we are, you know, as a liberal arts college in the middle of New York City, um, as a women's college connected to an Ivy League research institution literally across the street. And so all of those things kind of make up who we are. And so those aspects should kind of be reflected in, in why you think this is the right place. And, and so I'm very intentional about who we are and who we aren't, um, you know, a women's college may not be for everyone. Um, and, you know, I think there 
there are students where there are misconceptions that students may have about what a women's college is, but we're not trying to force people to consider a women's college if that is not for you. If you are, if that is a co-ed institution and that is what you're looking for, granted, we kind of have that here because we're not on an island and Columbia is across the street um, and there is that engagement, but there is a, a, a community of students who are intentionally making a decision to attend a women's college because they want to be surrounded by other women who are going to support them and encourage them and 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 really inspire them throughout their four years um, who are eager to take a, a very interdisciplinary curriculum and really dive in who want to examine issues through the lens of gender and and other you know identities um, and, and, and really start to have an experience where not only are they growing as academic scholars, but they're also growing personally and understanding their own intersectional identities, learning how to be allies, understanding how to um, think about their own connection to power and privilege and how that helps them move in, or restricts them from moving in the world, whatever that may be. Um, you know, it is it is a space where you're with other women who love to learn, but also love to have fun and, and want to have a lot of choices in the way that they are engaging in the city, whether that's socially or whether it is in their academic or research studies. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're looking for that intellectual community, but you also want that supportive community of women, Barnard is a great place, especially if you want to be in the city. Um, but there may be students who don't want a city. There may be students who really want a large institution. There may be students who um, are thinking more of a pre-professional track. You know, it may not a liberal arts college may be not what they're looking for. If you want to major in business or journalism, that's not necessarily a liberal arts college. Um, but for those students that are looking for that intersections of those experiences, there really is nothing quite like us. I was, how can I follow that up? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, There's a trash no, okay. <laughs> Those palm so trees and those mountains together. <laughs> yeah, just hello. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, we have a challenge at Stanford where I think because of pretty uh, widely known name recognition and just rankings and all those other things that we just had to have a lot of students who apply because of the name. Uh, and it's clear when you read the application that they are not necessarily interested in what Stanford is and what our culture is and what our community is like. And sometimes I think those are the students who might be most surprised if we're not able to admit them because they're fantastic in like innumerable ways, but we have a lot of fantastic students in innumerable ways. And so we're looking for the students who are also a great match you know, for Stanford. I think for, for us, one of the things that as an East Coast person who's come to the West Coast that was really um, interesting to me and has really been how I try to describe Stanford best is that it's, it's very much collaborative over competitive. So mm -hmm. our students are very high achieving, but they are not high strung. There mm -hmm. is a real irreverence to the excellence that happens on campus. And it's, it's not what I was used to growing up, honestly, in Boston or what I was even used to in New York, but it's very much part of kind of like a California Bay Area culture. Um, you know, one of our most famous uh, graduation speeches was uh, Steve Jobs, who said, stay hungry, stay foolish. Uh, and it's it's definitely part of the Stanford mantra that we um, really care a lot about what we're doing. We care about impacting the world and creating a positive change in the world, but we do it all with a sense of kind of like family and cooperation. Uh, and hopefully, as I said, high achieving without being high strung, we really just want people to feel supported and collaborative uh, for the mm -hmm. most part. I, I mean, sometimes I joke that our athletics mascot is a dancing tree, which might give you an idea of the type of irreverence that we appreciate uh, on the Stanford campus. If you've heard of the Stanford marching band, they are very unique. You do not have to be able to play an instrument to be in the marching band. They will give you a kazoo and you can join. Uh, so it is it, that is the kind of vibe <laughs> that we have here. While at the same time, you know, Google is invented on campus and you know, great crazy things are happening here, but in that kind of environment. And when we look at other schools that are considered our peer schools, it's just different. And so when a student tells me, uh, Barry, we talked about this, but when a student tells me they're equitably interested in Princeton and Stanford, just as an example, 
Princeton is an incredible school, right? No, this is nothing. This is an incredible school. But that seems odd to me that you would be equitably interested in those two campuses because we are so different physically, culturally, I mean, truly just very different. Uh, and so we always encourage students to not just look at the name, but really try to get to know us because it'll make a big difference in your application as well and your chances of admission if you can show us that you truly understand who we are. Yeah, I think students have the sense that, you know, they get so fixated on the numbers and then they feel if they have that, that not getting in is a betrayal of sorts. But it's so important to know the schools on your list and not just know them, but know why each of them is on there and why you are, you know, attracted to one versus another. Um, and not every school is for everybody. And it's okay to be ambitious and have high aspirations, but that doesn't mean that every highly selective school out there is gonna be for you just because it's ranked something or you know the admit rate is a certain rate. And um, you know, I see just as a counselor over and over again, the colleges care. They care about more than that you're just smart. They usually have a very clear signal that you can handle the work and they can get it pretty quickly. And then it's sort of everything else. Um, and especially with the admit rates that you guys have. You have so many uh, great students who are applying and a lot of tough decisions to make. And so as an applicant, it's your job to get to know the schools and not just throw in an application because it's Stanford or because it's Barnard or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I even say, you know, when you're thinking about a place like a Barnard, like don't only think about why Barnard, but why Barnard and not another school in New York City? Why Barnard and not another women's college? You know, why Stanford and not another, you know, uh, school nearby in, in, the, in California or another one that tends to have a great reputation for STEM and creativity? You know, you really need to dig deep um, in, these, in these pools. So thank you for sharing that with, with everybody. Um, and with so many applications and, and, and obviously a limited number of spaces, you have less flexibility than a school, for instance, that might have a 20% admit rate, which, you know, by anyone's standards is still very low, but seemingly high relative um, to yours. But, you know, students know that there are high expectations academically to compete in any highly selective pool. And, but we also know that perfection isn't the goal and it can come across as boring and even almost a turn off sometimes. And I would love for you to speak a little bit about why chasing perfect, even if we wanna just think about it in the context of college admissions and not in the broader sense, but why chasing perfect is not the way to go. Well, first of all, it, it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, <laughs> perfection is, is, is an illusion. Um, you know, I, I think that we have some, some pretty incredible applicants. Um, and I always say that there are no perfect applicants um, because there are no perfect people, right? Um, you know, I, I think that within every application, there are pieces that are going to be great fits for, for our institution and others that aren't. Um, in a similar vein, for every institution, there are going to be some aspects of a college that you're going to love, and then there are going to be pieces that are not going to be right. Um, there are, for every student at every college, even the ones that you think are just utopias, if you go and you speak to those students, there are also going to be things that they say that they love about those schools and they hate about those schools. Um, and so it's really being able to take a kind of an eye and, and say like, okay, there's no right school that's, there's no one school that's right for everybody. There is a right student that's right for every school. Um, and so we are, 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 are balancing those two things and looking for students that are going to be great fits, but this chasing perfection is 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 really an illusion and and quite honestly i think it really sets ourselves up for a, a, a lot of frustration and thinking well if i did all of these things then i should be in and that's not what this process is about at all yeah i think the challenge for me is the term perfection in the context of we're talking about what we're talking about right now what what does that mean right and i think what's what is troubling for me is i think students say okay perfection means these check boxes that I've determined is what the college wants. And I'm going to just strive towards being perfect at these pieces. And it's just not a healthy way for anyone to, to be, right? And it, it, it might sadly actually hinder your chances as a, at admission because what you should be doing is exploring the things about which, about which you are passionate and that you want to do. 
And through exploring those things and engaging in those things, that'll probably make you a better applicant uh, trying to engineer your existence towards what you think is the perfect college applicant not only is it probably not going to work, but it actually might be counterproductive to what you're trying to do. Uh, yeah. Whereas exploring and engaging and, and by the way, chasing perfection, if you, if what you mean is you're excelling and you're like trying really hard and you're trying lots of new things, that's great. Please go for that. Uh, but, but do that in, in, in the pursuit of what you want yeah. and what makes you excited to learn and what makes you passionate. And that will absolutely, no, I shouldn't speak in absolutes. I'm almost certain it will make you a stronger candidate for admission than if you, you know, tried to reverse engineer it to be the perfect applicant to any school. Yeah. And then I just have um, two final questions. One about sort of um, nuts and bolts, which is, can you take us through the process of how you read in your office? So is it regional? Is, does every application go through the committee? Um, how many reads does each application get? Just kind of take us through the process. Yeah. So for, for our process, um, the first reader is your regional rep, um, and they'll do a first full evaluation on that file. Um, and then it will go to some form of committee. Um, so that committee could be two people, and it's, it's me and one other person, uh, or it could be a larger committee where the majority of our students are going and the counselor is presenting it to the committee and the there is a, a committee vote. Um, so there's never just one person deciding the fate <laughs> of, of a file. Um, it is a collaborative process. Um, and that's for a variety of different reasons. Um, but mostly, I think it really helps with any sort of implicit bias um, to make sure that we are being thorough, that to make sure that uh, we are really considering all aspects of the applicant instead of just having one person put eyes on it and make a decision. And that's just for our process. It works um, given the size that we are in the class. So we also read regionally. Um, and so if you go to our website, you can see every admission officer's name and what their territory is. So you can see who your admission officer is for your territory. But we also do have um, what we call seasonal readers. So these are people that we hire just for the reading process as kind of like adjunct readers onto our other staff. So if you're in charge of a territory as an admission officer, you also have a couple of, couple of adjunct readers with you as well. But you read your first reads in your territory. That first reader, the admission officer, can make a choice on that file right there if they don't think the student can make it all the way to admission um, to let them go. Uh, but often they will do a full read and pass it on to the second reader. The second reader then does their full read and then it's the job of the regional admission officer to look at their entire territory and consider all the various university priorities and the strengths of the students. And then they bring a certain amount of students from their territory to a committee. Uh, and then they present uh, all the students that, that they're bringing from their territory. And then we vote as a committee on, on each student. Uh, and so anyone who's admitted to Stanford has gone through two reads and a committee process to Great, thank you. And um, to wrap up, I would love to pose your own questions to each of you. And so you both have supplements um, with essay questions. And um, Mike, if you could answer, this is one of Stanford's questions, what historical moment or event do you wish you could have witnessed? Okay, so I'm gonna answer it and then I'm gonna like step back and say why I think the answer is a good answer to give. We're not gonna keep it as like, you know, 300 words or anything. <laughs> yeah, well, this, is, a, <laughs> this <laughs> is one of our 50 word questions. So I have a very limited window to, to say this anyway. So um, I would choose to visit the Stonewall riots in June in 1969 in New York. Uh, it's a really important moment to me and my community as a, a queer person in that community. It was a time where we actually allowed the most marginalized within our community to lead us and lift us up and guide us towards inclusion and a voice in this country. And I love this country and I love my community. And that's why I'm excited to study American studies and economics at Stanford to hopefully give back to my community and, and continue to lift them up. So why would I do that one? To me, uh, that's a good way to talk about yourself, who you are, bring it back to the university. When we're asking you those questions, they're really like kind of secret ways for us to see if you really know about us. Uh, so you can show that you know the school, you know yourself. Uh, we're not looking for a certain type of political perspective or sociocultural perspective. 
bring, bring it all. Uh, but I think bringing yourself to those questions and then placing yourself at a university can be really helpful. Great. Uh, um, and Christina, uh, this is an optional question at Barnard, but we're not going to make it optional for you today. We're going to ask you to do it. <laughs> um, pick one woman, an historical figure, a fictitious character, or modern individual to converse with for an hour and explain your choice. Why does this person intrigue you? What would you talk about? What questions would you ask them? Mm. So the person that I would choose is Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston uh, was a writer, a uh, Black female writer during the Harlem Renaissance. She is the writer of my favorite book, uh, Their Eyes for Watching God. She is also the namesake for my new dog that I've had for three weeks and I love dearly. Um, she was just a powerhouse. She was also the first Black graduate of Barnard. Um, and uh, she majored in anthropology. She was a writer. Her classmate was Margaret Mead in the same anthropology department. Um, and she became one of the most well-known writers uh, during the Harlem Renaissance. And so my, my question is, you know, that kind of as a Black woman being that first and sometimes being in those spaces, even during the Harlem Renaissance, even amongst um, other Black writers, there weren't many women writers at the time. Um, and what her impact it has been on, um, on, on writing for women by women in that space and how she was able to navigate that time, um, especially in the, in the 30s, in the 40s, um, where it's so hard for women's voices to be heard. Um, and, and how she was able to kind of gain that sense of confidence uh, being the only at Barnard during that time. Um, and, and what would she say to the students, uh, to Black students who are currently at Barnard, given the racial reckoning that we just had and the work that's continuing to be done at Barnard, what would she, um, what would she say as that first? Um, and so like, same thing with, with Mike. This is my person. It just happened to be tied to Barnard as an alum. It did not have to be, um, but it is someone that I admire for a variety of reasons. Um, but it, it's not so much about the person, but it's about the inquiry. Um, it's about the question and why you're, you are choosing this person. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that you might, you could ask them questions about why you did what you did. We, we get a lot of, um, uh, questions to to women who were not so popular <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's again it's a little bit of yourself and then tying it back somehow I'm not surprised that Barnard applicants ask the tough questions <laughs> not surprising at all <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, that's, I think, a perfect way uh, for us to wrap up. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time and being honest and giving us helpful information um, to use and go forward, both for the students um, out there as well as the counselors. So thanks so much to both of you and uh, really, really, really appreciate it. And good luck this year. Thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Bye.